Thank you, sir. I'd like to thank the ISG, uh, in particular, Professor Saraswat and uh, my friend, Dr. Govind Makaria, for giving this opportunity. Uh, I'm sure that uh, these activities started by ISG will definitely benefit all the students uh, across the country. So I'm happy to start uh, first webinar uh, today that we are discussing on the current management of acute pancreatitis. Now, uh, briefly, if you if you if you see all across the country, most pay, most hospitals in the gastroenterology, uh, one of the commonest indications for admission hospitalization is acute pancreatitis. In fact. In a couple of years back, there was a report from U.S. that this was the commonest indication for hospital admission across U.S. Uh, under gastroenterology. So the outline of my talk would be basically focusing on the management within the first 72 hours, within the first week, second and third week, and fourth week and beyond. And the reason that I'm emphasizing about the management uh, in different time periods you will see subsequently is very important to understand. But these are not rigid boundaries, but this will give you an idea how do we manage these patients. Now, the first description of acute pancreatitis was, was given by a Dutch anatomist, uh, Nicholas Stulp in 1652. The incidence varies from different countries, uh, anywhere from 30 to 100 uh, per 100,000 population. If you look at the mean age of patients, this is somewhat younger in India compared to uh, Europe and, and North America. It's about 40 in India. And uh, this is based on a recent uh, study published in GUT. Uh, actually, this is online published in November this year, last year. And if you look at the male, female, it is around 50% all over the world. In India, the report was around 70% uh, males. The etiology is gallstone, as you know, in 40 to 45% of patients, uh, alcohol in a quarter of patients, post ERCP is fortunately less, but still accounts for 5% in centers which perform a lot of ERCPs. But idiopathic is around 25%, where we really don't know the cause in the beginning itself. So how do we manage these patients? And let me take you first to uh, the initial period of acute pancreatitis when a patient is admitted with us. Now, this is the typical clinical scenario of a 55-year-old lady who comes with abdominal pain for about a day. Pain is quite severe. She has vomiting. Her amylase is 740. Her X-ray of the abdomen is normal. And I want to emphasize here uh, for the students that whenever you see a patient with acute abdominal pain, you must get an X-ray of the abdomen done in the casualty itself in all patients, regardless of uh, what you think is the likely diagnosis. So uh, exit of the abdomen was normal, the amylase was high, and rightly the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis was, was considered. Uh, ultrasound shows a bulky pancreas, small fluid collection, uh, peripancreatic and gallbladder stones. The liver function test showed bilirubin of 1.8, SGPT 260 units. So the diagnosis was acute pancreatitis may cause biliary pancreatitis. Now, I want to emphasize here that whenever you see a patient with acute pancreatitis, if the liver function test is abnormal within the first 24 to 48 hours, you are dealing with, with gallstone pancreatitis, even if you do not see stones in the gallbladder. On the other hand, if you have stones, but your LFT is absolutely normal, etiology may not be gallbladder stones. For example, a patient with alcoholism, chronic alcoholism comes with acute pancreatitis. He also has gallstone. How do you decide which is the likely cause? It is the abnormal LFT which will tell you it is biliary or otherwise. Now, in some patients where you consider microlithiasis as the cause because you have not found any cause, patient has recovered, he comes back for follow-up, you think it could be microlithiasis. Now, the best uh, test to say it is called, it is microlithiasis is again, go back to the records and find out if the LFT was abnormal in the first 48 hours or not. If it was not, it is very unlikely to be gallstone induced. Now in this patient, CT was not done. And as you would understand, you all know that CT is not required for the diagnosis unless there is a diagnostic dilemma. That means 
you're not sure what you're dealing with. Otherwise, CT to determine whether or not it is necrotizing pancreatitis or it is severe pancreatitis is not really required. So what are the things that come to your mind on day one? One, if you are functioning in a, in a peripheral center, when do I refer this patient? Uh, what analgesics to be given? Because the patient's main symptom is pain. He's nil by mouth. He has got pain. He needs IV fluids. How much and what to give? If he has gallstone pancreatitis, do I need to do ERCP? When do you do a CT? I told you not to do a CT in the beginning. Does he require antibiotics? And how about his nutrition over subsequent days? So the first question is, when do you refer a patient? You're sitting in a, in a primary care or a secondary care. You don't have facilities for managing sick patients. Two things will tell you. If a patient has SIRS, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, which is persistent for, say, more than 24 hours, this is a patient who needs to be sent to a higher center. Or within next first, first two days or so, patients develop signs of organ failure. Again, this is the patient who needs to be sent to a higher center. Very simple, easily, easily measurable in any setting. So the first management problem is pain. And we need to give analgesia. We have two choices, either NSAIDs or opiates. The concern is with with either of them is safety. NSAIDs may cause little bit of renal failure or NGI bleed, while opiates may cause ileus and respiratory depression. So we, there are not much data actually which uh, analysis to choose. And we did a randomized control trial published last year in American Journal where we compared diclofenac, which is the most common uh, uh, analgesic used, with Fortwin, which is an opiate, pentazocene. And the reason we thought was that diclofenac being anti-inflammatory and analgesics, it might give us a better analgesia. Uh, so what we did was we randomized patients to receive either diclofenac or pentazocene, eight hourly, 75 milligram, 30 milligram. And we also provided injection fentanyl as a rescue analgesia through a patient controlled analgesia pump. What we found was uh, surprisingly that Fortwin, the pentazocene was, was better in terms of providing analgesia and pain-free period compared with diclofenac. There was a couple of uh, side effects in the diclofenac group, which we were not sure was because of the drugs, but overall analgesic effect was better with, with fentanyl, with, with uh, Fortwin. So in general, my advice is that opiates are better analgesics in patients with acute pancreatitis. But if a patient does no, no response, you can add uh, either IV paracetamol or IV diclofenac if uh, required. The second issue is about analgesia, uh, is about IV fluids. Once you have given adequate analgesia, which is very important, you consider uh, IV fluids. Between day one and day three is this most important. Now, most patients are kept nil by mouth in the beginning. So they need fluids. So questions are, what is the usual fluid deficit in acute pancreatitis? As you all know, whenever there is a lot of inflammation, the fluid goes out of the vascular compartment. <clears throat> the second is, what is the rate and type of fluid replacement and how do you guide your fluid therapy? So I'll spend a couple of minutes on this very important question, which is rather controversial. The first is, how much is the loss? Now, a very old study by Ranson et al, who's a very famous uh, surgeon, he showed that the fluid losses in acute pancreatitis were 3.7 liters and 5.6 liters in mild and severe pancreatitis. And thereafter, many people recommended that patients be given anywhere from five to six liters of fluid every day in the beginning. Now, subsequently, uh, another study uh, about five years back published from Spain, we showed the median fluid loss to be about 3.2 liters. And they showed the predictor of fluid deficit were younger age, alcohol, glucose, and SIRS. So how aggressive one should be? You give a lot of fluids or give less fluid. Now, there is a lot of confusion about this aggressive fluid in the, in the literature. So there was a, a systematic review of nine studies. We showed aggressive treatment group received about 4.5 liters of fluid in the first 24 hours, while non-aggressive was 3.5 liters. So it wasn't actually six or seven liters. And various people use various strategies, anywhere from 15 to 20 ml of per kg bolus fluid, followed by 1.5 to 3 ml per kg per hour infusion. 
or for the next 48 hours or so, depending on the response. So which flu to give? So normally crystalloids are given, uh, either normal saline or Ringer's lactate. In a randomized trial of 40 patients, uh, Ringer lactate was found to be better than normal saline. And one of the reasons was that normal saline can lead to hyperchloremic acidosis. And another subsequent study also confirmed the same. So in general, the recommendation is to give Ringer lactate rather than normal saline. So how do you monitor when you give fluids? So the goals that you have to keep in mind are that I need to keep a minimum art mean arterial pressure of about 70. Okay, so patient comes in the hypotension, you give fluids. If he's fluid responsive, you're, you're good. If he's not, then you have to give vasopressors. But initially you have to give fluids. So my mean arterial pressure should be around 70. Hematocrit, around 40 to 42. Some people very rapidly dilute the, the, the hematocrit. That's not a good idea. And I want a minimum urine output of 0.5 to 1 ml per minute. That's my goal when I have to give fluid therapy. How do you measure whether you are doing a good job or not? So central venous pressure, which is generally placed in most of these patients, is not a good guide, especially those who are on ventilators. You may have stroke volume or arterial pressure, but again, this requires intra-arterial line, which is not done in most patients. But I would suggest that non-invasive uh, uh, measurement is very important. IVC diameter, and also I would emphasize lung ultrasound. And in most ICUs now, a bedside ultrasound is available. This is a, a video taken in our own ICU. You have a bedside ultrasound. You can easily, all the residents can easily measure the IVC diameter by doing a bedside ultrasound. And this can tell you uh, whether or not there is fluid deficit or patient is fluid repeat. The second thing I would advise is that all residents who are posted in ICU, actually we have our resident posted in ICU, they must learn lung ultrasound, which is not very difficult. What you're looking for is some kind of B lines here. If B lines are present, this patient is likely to have fluid overload. If you do a two or three day course, you can easily learn a lung ultrasound, particularly those who have been doing abdominal ultrasound. So what are the effects of fluid therapy? If you look at some of these studies, they showed that they favor aggressive, that means more fluid, that if you give less fluid, there is more SERS, organ failure mortality. But there are many studies now, including randomized trials, which have shown that aggressive fluid resuscitation may itself lead to organ failure, increased abdominal pressure, more need for ICU care and mortality. This study was published actually early this month from, from uh, Latin America, 88 patients randomized who presented after 24 hours. So in most tertiary care centers, will, patients will present after 24 hours. So this becomes important for, for most of those uh, centers. They randomized patients to non-aggressive, 1.5 ml per kg per hour for 24 hours versus aggressive, that is bolus or 20 ml per kg plus 3 ml per kg per hour. And then in both the groups, 30 ml per kg for next 24 hours. And they found that mean volume of fluid infused in the aggressive group was 8.5 liters versus 5.1 liters over 48 hours. So per day here was 4.2 liters, here it was 2.6 liters. And they found no difference in SERS, necrosis, organ failure, or hospital stay. So the point here is that in most patients who present to you, the general recommendation is to give about three to four liters of ringer lactate in first 24 hours. And this should depend on fluid assessment and severity. We should have caution in patients who are elderly, cardiopulmonary disease, intra-abdominal hypertension, or renal failure. And beyond three days, you have to give fluids as per the output of the patient. So this is about the fluid management. Now, this is day two to day four. The patient is febrile, counts are 14,000. PaO2 to FiO2 ratio is 280. Normally, it should be around 400 or more. It is 280, that means patient has grade two respiratory dysfunction. Creatinine is 2.4. Again, there is renal dysfunction. Bilirubin now has come down 1.1 from 1.8, and SGPT is again come down by, by half. Bladder urine culture, sterile, small fluid collection seen on, on ultrasound. So, what are the concerns on day two to day four? When I have given analgesia, I've started the patient on fluids. What do I do now? So the first concern here is the organ failure. This patient has two organ failures. She had some abnormal LFT, may have biliary obstruction. 
Do you need to do ERCP or not? So I'm not going to dwell on this in long in 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 detail. But ERCP is recommended only if patient has cholangitis. It is sometimes very difficult to assess there is cholangitis or not, or if there is increasing bilirubin. So in patients in whom you find LFT is improving, there is no reason you should do ERCP. One of the questions I just saw on the chat was whether to put stent in the in the in the uh, bile duct or not. So most patients will not require ERCP because most of the times what happens is that the stone passes out on its own within the first 48 to 72 hours. In those patients in whom you have to do ERCP for either cholangitis or increasing bilirubin, you have to put a stent. Okay, so that you leave till patient undergoes cholecystectomy. So the third concern here is prevent infected necrosis and fourth is nutrition. So for organ failure, patient has to be in ICU. This patient was managed in ICU. Prediction of organ failure is difficult, but I showed you in the beginning, if a patient has persistent SIRS for more than 48 hours or so, he has high likelihood that he might develop organ failure and severe acute pancreatitis because it is the persistent organ failure for more than 48 hours that defines severe pancreatitis. And these patients have very high mortality of 30 to 40 percent. And as of today, we can only provide uh, supportive treatment. The next issue is whether we can we should give prophylactic antibiotics to prevent infections in either of these groups: mild acute pancreatitis, severe acute pancreatitis, necrotizing pancreatitis, and is there a problem with prophylactic antibiotics? Now, multiple RCTs and meta-analyses have been done, and they have shown no benefit of giving prophylactic antibiotics except one study from Japan, which showed very early antibiotics may have some possible benefit, but most people recommend not to give prophylactic antibiotics. It is another matter though, that most of these patients do receive antibiotics. When they are present to a tertiary care center, we found in a study, multi-center study, about two thirds of patients had already received antibiotics. Now, sometimes there is a sense of false security that if you give antibiotics, you will decrease complication, but this is not done. Today, it's a litigant society now. If you give antibiotics, the patients are going to read in the, in the literature that antibiotics should not be given. And suppose something happens to the patient, they might actually take, take you to the court and say, why did you give these antibiotics? Because the problems here are leading to more resistant infections, gram positive infections, and of course, fungal infections. The next issue is about nutrition. And so when do you start nutrition in mild and severe? Does the timing affect the disease course? So one of the questions on the chat was, do you keep the patient nail orally? So most patients are kept nail orally in the beginning of the illness, started on IV fluids. And as their pain starts decreasing, then we think about uh, the nutrition. This is recommendation based on IP guidelines I'm giving you. So oral feeding should be started in mild pancreatitis where there is no organ dysfunction, uh, as soon as the pain starts subsiding. Now, this takes about two to three days and this time period is okay. There was one randomized trial published in NAJM many, about three years ago from, from Dutch uh, group, which showed that very early, within 24 hours of enteral feeding was not uh, beneficial. So you can wait for two, three days without any problem. And this is strong agreement there. Enteral tube feeding should be the primary therapy in patients with either severe pancreatitis or those who have predicted severe. Now, there's a little bit of a difference between these terminologies. So predicted severe is where you think patient might develop severe pancreatitis. Severe means organ failure. So as of today, suppose there is no organ failure, but he has persistent SIRS. You think he's a patient who would like to develop it. There you can start uh, enteral uh, feeding through a tube. Now, in these patients, you can give it either by nasojejunal or nasogastric, but nasogastric is easier. And there was a study done from our department by Dr. Raya, which showed that nasogastric tubing is as good as nasojejunal. The only problem is many of these patients cannot tolerate nasogastric feeding. And in that case, it is better to give nasojejunal tube. So final recommendation would be initiate enteral feeding as soon as possible, usually within next three to four days after the onset of disease. We prefer oral and enteral uh, feeding, preferably nasogenal in those with severe. Polymeric feed is given. Elemental feeding is not required. Uh, our goal is to provide 25 to 30 kilocalories per kg with 1.2 to 2 grams of protein. 
but if you are able to manage about 1000 calories in the beginning it is okay with us and we rarely rely on uh, uh, total parental nutrition so these are the learning points in the first week of illness with regard to the management first few days are critical adequate optimum hydration must be provided opioids are better than analgesics for pain relief there are early enteral nutrition is important and we don't need to give prophylactic antibiotics ERCP is infrequently required in these patients. Now, what I'll do is uh, I will see if I have some questions related to uh, uh, the uh, first part of my talk, and then we'll move forwards. So I have covered some of these questions, which were with regard to the nutrition and uh, ERCP. There was one question on ERCP. If there is a quick question on, on any of these in the first week, I can take it. Dr. Saraswati, if you can hear my voice, if you have any question the first week, I'd like to take it up now. Well, I think there, there's a flood of questions, uh, Pramod, over about, uh, I've got about uh, 45, 50 questions already on. Uh, I think first, once you have covered, which are the ones who need to be kept? So, so I'm, yeah. And uh, I think uh, my, uh, diagnosis of cholangitis during acute pancreatitis was another one, whether... EUS will have a role and also okay. how do you diagnose in the presence of SIRS. Okay. So, uh, so first of all, EUS has no role in the beginning. It is the LFT which should guide. I have seen a one question that if there is a patient with CBD stone but improving LFT after three days, my suggestion is to wait and do ERCP as you would do in a patient with CBD stone regardless of pancreatitis. So, if patient is improving, don't do ERCP because you might cause complications. There is one question about proton pump inhibitors. So generally, it is not recommended to give proton pump inhibitors. Uh, there is actually one uh, study which is going to come from China, which is showing alteration in duodenal microbiome uh, by, by proton pump inhibitors. So that should not be done. There are two questions about ulinastatin. So as of today, we do not have enough evidence to recommend use of ulinastatin for treating uh, uh, predicted severe or severe uh, acute pancreatitis. Uh, NLG6 during the first week, I mean, you talked about your uh, study, but people were asking whether tramadol or whether it can... So, so right. So, uh, opiates, so, whether they can in biliary pancreatitis cause a problem. Sure. So, there is another RCT published from PGI Chandigarh where they have compared daclofenac with tramadol. And tramadol was found to be as good as, as other analgesics. So, among opioids, tramadol is a good choice if you have uh, tramadol available. But my recommendation would be opioids rather than NSAIDs. There was another question about this cholangitis. How do you diagnose cholangitis? So in a patient with, with acute pancreatitis, if there is persistent abnormal LFT and your enzymes rather than decreasing are increasing and there is fever and leukocytosis suspect cholangitis because in acute cholangitis, your SGPT and SGOT will keep rising. So that's an important point. But I tell you, it is, it is difficult. So if you are in dilemma and your LFT is not improving, and you think there is obstruction, go ahead and do ERCP, no problem, okay? Uh, about the IV fluids also, there was a question about whether colloids like albumin can be used in the first so, week instead of just crystalloids. Okay, so some people have actually used colloids uh, like albumin, a 5% albumin or even a 20% albumin, but there is no recommendation to give colloids. What you can do, use your judgment, like do you do in critical care patients, that suppose you want to give fluids, and patient is showing signs of fluid overload, or there is a lot of edema coming in now, that means there is vascular uh, vascular uh, problems, uh, more, more fluid going out of the vascular compartment, then you may give uh, uh, colloids in form of, of uh, uh, albumin. Okay, so let me now go, go ahead. Yeah. In the meanwhile, you can uh, see if there are questions, I'll take care of. Sure. Okay, so sure. now patient is entering the second week, and this is the time when you have to now consider other issues. So the concerns in patients with second and third week, and these are the patients who have either moderate or severe acute pancreatitis. Mild pancreatitis will, will improve within a week or so. You really don't have to worry about those patients. So the concerns here are that is organ failure improving or continuing? Are you able to maintain nutrition or not? Is there now fluid collections coming up? Is there infection? Because this is a time when patient might develop second infection. Does the patient require antibiotics now? Because we have not given earlier. And how do you manage these fluid collections and infection? So nasojejunal feeding was started in this patient. 
SARS was continuing, but the creatine came down to 1.4. So there was improvement in our organ failure. PAO2 FIO ratio also improved. Again, there was improvement with this. So we are happy with that. If there is no improvement, you got to continue them in ICU. And many of these patients may require hemodialysis or ventilator support. We are currently doing a study where seeing whether NIV uh, can help tide over the crisis in those who may ultimately require ventilation. Now, this patient, we found there was a collection developing uh, on ultrasound about 10 centimeters and patient continued to be unwell. So if you have persistent organ failure, I told you very high mortality. And most of the times, those who are going to die will die within the first two weeks. So more than 50% of deaths occur within the first two weeks of illness. And when we discuss about infected necrosis and pseudocyst and world of necrosis, we often forget about those patients who have died in the early course of the disease. And these are the patients who require more attention, okay? So we all all happy doing our cyst drainage, but I think the emphasis must be placed on those who have uh, severe disease and organ dysfunction. So for nutrition is critical now. Why? Because these are the patients who are going to have a prolonged battle. They are not going to improve soon. And again, as I said, our target is to provide about 1,500 to 2,000 calorie diet. And you, if you have not placed a naso, naso enteral tube, please do so in the second week for sure. So the next is fluid collections. Is infection developing? Does the patient have necrotizing pancreatitis? We have not done a CT. Does the patient require antibiotics? And how do we manage these patients? So in this patient, now you do a CT because patient is unwell, there is fever, there is high counts. We need to know what is happening. Are there collections? So if you find a collection and there is necrotizing pancreatitis, two factors will determine the outcome, the amount of necrosis and the size. If the necrosis is more than 30% or there is significant peripancreatic necrosis or the size, size is large, they're likely to persist rather than resolve. So should we drain if there is a sterile fluid collection? Patient's fever is minimal, counts are okay. There is some, in, there is some unwell, uh, patient's little unwell, SIRS may be plus minus, what do you do? So there was one RCT of 40 patients with sterile fluid collections, randomized to conservative treatment versus catheter drainage. And the authors found that in conservative group, 55%, about half of them required drainage later on. But 55% of patients who underwent catheter drainage in the beginning developed infection, although the first culture was sterile. And in the conservative group, 45 improved uh, without uh, intervention. Uh, so another study also showed about 60% patients develop infection following drainage of a sterile collection. And that is why most guidelines suggest that patients in the second and third week of illness, if you have sterile fluid collection, conservative treatment should be done and drainage should be done only if they are symptomatic. Now, if fever is continuing and counts are rising, now you suspect that there is infection. So earlier we used to do a fine needle aspiration cytology, but our own experience and other experience from other centers showed that FNA to diagnose uh, infection is not really uh, uh, very important in, in such a situation because you have to act now because you're suspecting uh, infected necrosis. So question is, do we drain? or not, does she require necrosectomy? So first is antibiotics or not. Surely in this patient is fever is persisting beyond first week or there is an onset of new infection, new fever and TLC increasing, it's prudent to start antibiotics. Now serum procalcitonin may be of help at this stage. So there was a question related to procalcitonin. So in the first week of illness, we have seen in a study that procalcitonin is also raised even without infection. And that has been seen in other studies also. But if you are in the second or third week, you suspect infection, a rising procalcitonin or a high procalcitonin is a good guide that patient is likely to have infected necrosis and you should start antibiotics. Which antibiotic will depend on your local culture sensitivity? For example, in our hospital now, most patients have resistant infections. So we start them on right away with either piprocin gazobactam or, or cephaprone cell bactam. That's our first antibiotic. Uh, because otherwise uh, they have resistant infection. If fever persists, you're not happy with one antibiotic, you suspect pseudomonas infection, then we can give second antibiotic, but usually we give one in the beginning on empirical basis. 
And most patients will require a CT where you can see large areas of pancreatic and peripheral necrosis. And, and sometimes you have extensive necrosis and extensive inflammation in the abdomen like in this patient. So uh, uh, you have to decide what do you do now. And next question is drain or not? Mind you, we are in the second and third week of illness, not beyond that. So should we drain or not? Now, there are not much data about draining in the second and third week of illness. So the guidelines published 2013 showed invasive intervention, including percutaneous, where possible should be delayed until at least four weeks for collection to vault off. So guideline would say wait. So there was one, so right now there is no randomized trial. There was one retrospective study published from, from Netherlands uh, of 117 patients in whom they found some of these patients had gone early drainage, some drainage after four weeks, and they found that there was similar hospital stay and mortality, but the need for necrosectomy was somewhat less in early group. So the Dutch group is conducting a randomized trial in such patients, and we are also doing a randomized trial of early versus late percutaneous drainage in patients with deteriorating condition in the second and third week. So the, the message here is, if your patient is deteriorating and continuing to have fever on antibiotics, you should drain. This patient underwent uh, drainage uh, and antibiotics and then improved. So this is the summary of my, my talk in the second and third week of illness, where it's a period of basically waiting. You don't have to do intervention in most patients. They require maximal ICU support. Conservative therapy is the norm. Nutrition is the key. And if there is organ failure or sepsis is worsening, we may be required to drain the collection that you have. And for this, you need to do a good CT and then it should ideally be done under CT guidance. Okay. So I, I'll again see if I can, uh, I can, I can take some questions uh, uh, because um, before I proceed further, Dr. Saraswat, if you are there, you can see if the question I have to answer now. Oh, sure. I think just give me a sec. Yeah, there seem to be a, a lot of questions as usual. I think we have crossed 100 or maybe, I don't know, 100 plus by now. <laughs> so now uh, one question is, is there a role for CT guided aspiration uh, in the second week to rule out infected necrosis or patients should be started empirically on antibiotics with the suspicion of infection? So uh, in general, the role of CT guided FNA is now given up. If you strongly suspect infection and patient is not improving on antibiotics, my suggestion is to drain. So we generally wait for about a week or so and see the effect of antibiotics before we plan drainage. Otherwise, it's not, it's not recommended now to do uh, FNA. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is... Uh... Um, the other thing was, I think, going back to your earlier question about um, analgesics and feeding. Uh, one question was, do patients have to be pain-free before you start uh, enteral feeding or a mild pain? With mild pain, you can start enteral feeding. So, so mild pain, we can start, uh, but it depends on patient's to tolerance. If patient is able to tolerate soft liquid diet, uh, about 500 calories or so, this is fine and gradually increase as per patient's tolerance. You don't have to force feed the patient. That's very important. One of the questions I was seeing is about TRCP versus MRCP. I think only when you are really, you know, unsure, you may do MRCP, otherwise don't do MRCP in these patients who are sick. So if LFT is improving, wait, okay? Right, coming back so, to antibiotics, I think there were a couple of questions on that also, which if you can take in right, uh, right away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so sure. One was uh, if there is a coexisting infection like in the chest or the lungs uh, and in severe acute pancreatitis, would you what antibiotic or would you start or would you start antibiotic? So, yes. So whenever you have a patient with suspected infection, that means you are in the second or third week of illness, patient is running fever, counts are rising, you, you suspect infection, even if it is non-pancreatic, you must start antibiotic. And in a study done many, many years ago, we found that actually more than a third of patients have non-pancreatic infections. So they, they need antibiotics. So shall I proceed for the next uh, part? Just which will one, take about... one second. One yeah, was sure. mentioned about people reading guidelines and then uh, maybe suing doctors for using antibiotics uh, inappropriately. This yeah. is a question play riffing on that, which says that if a patient has high TLC fever 
later on goes to develop sepsis in the second week uh, can't he be sued for doctor be sued for not starting antibiotics in the first week yeah sure but you, you can obviously you know court studies which say that in the first week the fever and rising tlc is because of the illness itself not because of infection this is a sterile inflammation which leads to that so don't worry about that there is enough literature to support you in the court right. and if patient has to take it he will take you anyway don't worry <laughs> okay go ahead okay. Uh, yeah sure so uh, now what happens that most of the patients like i showed you may improve if they are not very sick their organ failure has improved if there is infected necrosis you treat with antibiotics you, and if required for cross drainage but antibiotics must be given at least for 2 to 3 weeks sometimes we have to give it a 4 weeks so depends on how much infection is there how the patient is responding okay but there are patients who will not improve who will continue to have problems and we are in the fourth week and beyond now so what happens Th these are the patients who have definitely suspected infected necrosis so fever may be continuing you have rising counts like this so there are two situations you have already placed a percutaneous stain or you have not placed a percutaneous stain and i'll take up both uh, next subsequently so the question is does the patient require necrosectomy in the fourth week onwards or not so uh, we did a, a comparative study published many years ago because we found many of our patients who had a uh, confirmed infected necrosis actually improved without necrosectomy because necrosectomy was the norm uh, at that time and we found of 80 patients the survival in those who were treated medically was 76% versus those treated surgically which was only 46% and mind you this is the figure seen all over the world and we found that uh, medically managed patients had better survival it is quite possible that those who had undergone surgery were more sick patients but having said that the idea here was that we can treat patients with infected necrosis even without the need for necrosectomy so we did a systematic review and meta analysis of eight studies which had looked at this issue of infected necrosis do they require necrosectomy or not and we found that with or without percutaneous drainage there was 64% success rate 70% patient required catheter drainage the requirement for necrosectomy was only 26% with a mortality of 12% so this reaffirmed our belief that there are patients with infected necrosis who can be treated without necrosectomy and this has been subsequently uh, you know um, results of many other studies so this is the step up approach recommended by most societies and guidelines conservative treatment first followed by percutaneous drainage and followed by minimally invasive necrosectomy if patient doesn't improve so you as you know everybody wants a patient like this who has got a large collection walled off just opposite the the stomach very well formed wall patient is stable no organ failure and now everybody wants let me do endoscopic drainage and necrosectomy sure enough that granted you can do that but often you have to make sure that how much is the debris inside before you jump in so ultrasound can show you a lot of debris inside in such a collection mr of course is better we showed you large areas of necrosis within this what looks like a pseudosis is actually a wall of necrosis lot of uh, uh, debris here the black area is the debris the white is the fluid here so you, you have to do ultrasound and if required mri to determine you dealing with pseudosis or you dealing with wall of necrosis most of the time you will be dealing with wall of necrosis so if necrosis is required this is study from from uh, aig hyderabad sandeep lakte ke publishes endoscopic step up that of 205 patients he showed Uh, successful drainage with 75% patients 9 patient 9% required necrosectomy the two rcts have been published one is tension trial the other is miser trial both showed that endoscopic step up therapy is feasible and equally effective in patients with lesser complications so both these studies had patients who had large collections uh, which were well formed and you can see this is a busy slide but the overall mortality was around 18 and 13% in the tension trial but less than 10% in the in the miser trial and these were patients who had infected necrosis so in in such a patient you can surely go and do a standard endoscopic drainage and today the standard uh, therapy is eus guided drainage you can either place a plastic stent or a metal stent so if you have less than third one third of necrotic debris you can easily place plastic stent 
otherwise if you have a stable patient the collection that i showed you very well formed uh, it is better to place a metal stent like this which provides better drainage the other advantage of metal stent is that it is easier to enter the cavity subsequently for doing uh, lavage of the cavity if the fever persist and also if required necrosectomy so you can do necrosectomy uh, through the stent very well sometimes there is a risk of you know stent migrating out so one has to be very careful doing this procedure and my recommendation is not to do necrosectomy in the index procedure you have to wait if patient improves and majority of patients will improve and that they will not require necrosectomy now if you have placed a plastic stent for drainage this world of necrosis and patient develops infection or they don't improve you can see here this is a patient with no plastic stents were placed you have to go inside again now dilate this tract to about 15 mm with a cre balloon and then you can see pus coming out of that cavity and then you have to enter this cavity uh, with the help of a standard upper gi endoscope uh, and and then lavage the cavity so in the beginning what we do is we only do lavage and only later uh, if when patient is stable we do necrosectomy because necrosectomy will take time and many of these patients may require intubation and you have to do the procedure under general anesthesia so uh, with lavage alone many of these patients will improve uh, after your uh, with your antibiotics okay so sometimes you can do it in one sitting sometimes they require two or three sittings and then you see the cavity is almost clean and patient will be fine now one thing i want to emphasize is about these tension and miser trials because these are the two trials everybody talks about these are the patients in those two trials patient infected necrosis were treated but they were stable patients mean duration of drainage was about 6 weeks most patients 90% had walled off necrosis and they were all suitable for endoscopic drainage now sometimes when you don't read the literature well you will feel oh everybody with infected necrosis can be treated by per oral endoscopic you just place a metal stent and everybody will be fine that is not the case you have to judge what kind of patient do you have is the patient sick is the patient in icu is the patient having organ failure is the collection suitable for drainage or not so many factors have to be taken into account so patient in icu organ failure or conservative treatment is going on and you have placed the percutaneous drainage already now if you have placed the percutaneous drainage patient is not improving first of all all the fluid has gone out it is extremely difficult to do per oral drainage and necrosectomy in these patients most of the time you have to do what is known as minimal invasive necrosectomy by ward so for example or you have a large collection like this which is much away from the stomach you can't do a per oral drainage you have extensive necrosis again much away from the stomach you can't do per oral drainage here or and you have placed a stent like this so for example this is one of our patients who whom large collection was there a per percutaneous drain was placed so what do you do in this so what we do is to do what is called as percutaneous endoscopic necrosectomy but most of the time majority of centers what they will do is to do a minimally invasive surgical necrosectomy and i think that's a perfectly uh, fine uh, treatment for these patients so patient with percutaneous drainage not improving next treatment is minimally invasive necrosectomy it can be done surgically and they can use either a ward uh, or a nephroscope can be used and most of the patients will require just one sitting sometimes they require Uh, multiple sittings if they have a complication so using the same technique the the track of the percutaneous drain we do percutaneous endoscopic necrosectomy so we dilate this track to about 12 mm and then use a regular upper gi endoscope for lavage and necrosectomy so you can see this one patient had multiple drains here it is at the we are doing at the bed side of the patient this is a ultra thin scope which is going uh, through the same track for lavage and here is a patient in whom Uh, there was a large uh, collection in necrosectomy so you dilate this tract and use a upper gi endoscope to enter the cavity much like you do in per oral uh, endoscopic necrosectomy do a lavage take out the necrotic debris using either a basket or a, or a snare snare generally is the most commonly used and then you find that uh, uh, in two three or four sittings uh, the cavity may become cleaner now i want to caution you here that first time don't try to do necrosectomy what we do is to do just lavage and once the patient is stable then only we try necrosectomy 
And lavage alone, when you take out all the debris from the inside, uh, the thin debris and all the pus like fluid, the patients improve. So this is a procedure which can be done uh, in your endoscopy theater under conscious sedation. Okay. And this can be uh, performed uh, by those who are experienced, but you have to be very, very careful when you do such a procedure. So um, this is how you can take out small, small debris. Sometimes you take out large debris, but that is uncommon. And the cavity looks like this after you have drained. So we published our results in 2015 of only 15 patients, but subsequently we published results of 53 patients who underwent percutaneous endoscopic nectrosectomy, 84% improved, eight of them died, five after surgery, and eight had complications, two peritonitis, both improved, two had bleeding, two had fistula. So this is a procedure which is something like uh, minimal invasive surgical necrosectomy, and uh, it can be done. So the current recommendation is in patients with infected necrosis, conservative first approach for infected necrosis and minimal invasive necrosectomy uh, uh, if there is no improvement. But the problem doesn't end here. You think if you take out all the debris, you do necrosectomy, you treat the patient in ICU, they will all improve. That's not the case. And we published a study uh, in 2018 of 209 patients with acute pancreatitis. Saranshu, uh, who was in, with us at that time, he published this study. Uh, in, in mortality was 22%. And we found that independent predictors of, uh, of, of mortality were organ failure, which I've already shown you. And the other problem, which is now coming up, is MDR infection, very odd 0.4. So now our patients are all resistant to piplacentazobactam, imipanam, meropan, everything. And we end up giving tigicycline or, or cholestine to these patients. So that's another major problem which is coming in, uh, in these patients. There are many other problems these patients might develop. One is intra-abdominal hypertension, hemorrhage, either from the cavity, from a small vessel, or from a pseudonism, for which you may need to do a DSA and embolization, intestinal fistula, sometimes colonic fistula, for which they may require surgery, and infected ascites with multiple septic. Now, these are the problems which further complicate the course, may require other interventions, including surgical interventions, but time will not permit me to discuss these, these, these issues. But I can take up questions if there are some questions related to that. So where do we go from now? How do we improve the outcomes? So one, we need to develop therapies to target systemic inflammation. Unfortunately, we don't have any therapy available as of today but people are working on that and we might have something in the next five to 10 years. We need to bring down this issue of multi-drug resistant infection. This is coming up in a big way and I'm sure many of you are seeing this problem. And please don't drain every collection that you see, otherwise you will end up introducing infection, which wasn't there earlier, okay? So the summary of my third portion of my talk is that infected necrosis, conservative first approach, uh, conservative to PCD to minimal necrosectomy, you have to differentiate between pseudocyst and Waldorf necrosis. If you have Waldorf necrosis, which is symptomatic, you can do either endoscopic drainage or ward. For stable patients, EUS guided drainage is, is done. And if there is significant debris, you do place a metal stent. For infected, unstable patients, my suggestion would be percutaneous endoscopic necrosectomy or ward. And we have to understand that this is a team approach. You have to involve your surgeons and your intervention radiologists right in the beginning. Otherwise, you won't be able to manage these patients well. So thank you all very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions now. Dr. Saraswat, sir. Yes. Uh, a fantastic presentation, uh, Pramod. I think, unfortunately, on these webinars, there's not uh, much in the way of clapping and applause for the speaker at the That's end of the session. Yeah. But I think one index is that I think there are over 325 questions that have come in and it's obviously impossible. You can spend the My rest of the God. night trying to answer these questions. So, so what, I'll, what I'll do is, sir, what I'll yeah. do is I'll take up some questions now if you have time. And the others, I will request the team to send me the question and I will send uh, the answers to okay. all those questions. I'll yeah, do that. That's absolutely great. So I think one of the questions that is uh, related to the endoscopic drainage you are talking about was uh, how many sessions of endos endoscopic percutaneous necrosectomy versus ward? Uh, are there any data for effective for large collections? So when, when, so when we do per oral endoscopic drainage, what uh, Sandeep has shown is that majority of patients you can get away without necrosectomy. 
So if you do a metal stent, you place a metal stent, most of these patients will be, will be okay. You have to do lavage in some patients if they develop fever, if they have running fever. Otherwise, less than 10% patient will require necrosectomy. This figure will vary. This may be 30%, 40%, 20%. As we accumulate more evidence, we will we'll, we'll tell you. But everything will be guided by patient's condition. Response. Yes. So do you follow a protocol of looking at the response and then going so, in? So, is there a limit to the number of times you want to go in? Or uh, right. it is only dictated by the patient's condition? So if it's patient condition which guides. But what we do is when we place a metal stand, within a week we go back in, planned way, do a lavage, make sure that we have all the infected material out. We don't touch the necrosis and we watch. If patient is doing all right, we do nothing more. We take out the stent after about two weeks. Our protocol instead of three is about two weeks. But if patient is running fever, then we will do necrosectomy. And we do necrosectomy on demand. That means we do it today. We'll do it after two or three days till we find that there is no significant debris remaining there. And about hydrogen peroxide during uh, endoscopy? So, so we, how yeah, right. so we were only using hydrogen peroxide for this uh, lavage at the end of the procedure, both peroral as well as when we are doing percutaneous endoscopic necrosectomy, but we have stopped doing now because in some of our patients, in fact, in this report, two patients developed peritonitis and we thought that it could be because of the hydrogen peroxide. So we have actually stopped doing that. Right. Another interesting question was you're doing percutaneous endoscopic necrosectomy and have, have you had the problem of a fistula or a persistent discharging sinus so, after percutaneous endoscopic? Another important question. Sir. So most of the patients, there is no problem. So what we do is we downsize our catheter. So our size of catheter when we are doing necrosectomy will be 30 to 32 French. And then once we are sure that the cavity is clean now, we downsize it to 16 and then to 12. And then we place a rice tube, cut it, and put a colostomy bag there. So some of these patients will keep draining some fluid for, for a month or even longer. But majority of times, they do well. We haven't actually done ERCP for, for if I remember correctly, for none of these patients. I see. And uh, any experience with encountering uh, portal vein injury or bleeding during necrosectomy? And then so, so, so portal vein we have never seen, but we have seen bleeding in the collection. So... During the procedure, one has to be very careful not to go if you see any visible vessel. In fact, it is better just to put some saline and come out. But we have seen hemorrhage within the, within the collection in about 8 to 10 percent of patients who have undergone percutaneous drainage. And this is something that uh, we are seeing more often. Maybe we are seeing more complicated patients, patients with large areas of necrosis, infected necrosis, who have bigger size drains put in. So that is a problem. Related, but one caution here is don't try to remove debris which is adherent, which is very important. If you try and remove the adherent debris, you will end up in problem. Uh, another question related to metal stents. Uh, yeah. Nagi stent, <laughs> now you have the Jemitra people with the stent, there is a Spaxa stent. There are, which one would you choose uh, for? Uh, so I would say that all these stents are similar. There is not much difference, except that if you talk about hot axios, the hot axios advantage is that uh, it's a one-step procedure. You don't have to use other accessories and you can just simply place it. Uh, the only problem with that is the cost. And if the cost of the stent comes down, I would say that this would be a preferable stent. But as of today, the cost is pretty high. So I'm not sure that, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is the best stent. Right. My, my problem here is the cost. And uh, any experience with the pancreato plural fistulae uh, management? Yes, so many patients may have plural, plural uh, effusion. All of them do not have this fistula. Some patients may have fistula. This is more of a problem patient with chronic pancreatitis, not so much in acute pancreatitis. So if you have significant effusion, my suggestion would be to place a, a PCD there rather than repeated drainage. Just place a 8 to 10 French of percutaneous uh, pigtail drainage and they will do well. Most patients do not have a persistent pancreatic plural fistula. Right. In chronic, yes, they might. Uh, for the endoscopic large collections, we have mainly spoken about endoscopic drainage in various routes. How about standard percutaneous drainage? And the interesting question is, is it some way you can judge based on pancreatic or fluid amylase or other parameters, whether the large collection has a communication with the pancreatic duct or not before you decide percutaneous versus endoscopic? So first of all, amylase may help you, but in practical terms, it doesn't. Most of the time, you will find the amylase is high. 
most of the time there is a communication with the duct that's why they have necrosis and large fluid collections so most patients as i told you in step up therapy will undergo a percutaneous drainage and only those who do not improve will require surgical necrosectomy so but if you have managed the patient well for 3 or 4 weeks and after that you you find even in the fourth week itself that there is a well formed collection with well defined wall you can straight away go and do endoscopic drainage rather than placing a percutaneous drain if it is of course suitable cl uh, close to the stomach or duodenum right i think that the <coughs> for other large collections paracolic pelvic is there any role for any endoscopic or percutaneous management yes so this is what i had shown you that for large collections away from the stomach the standard is to place a percutaneous drain we upsize this drain to gradually to 30 french and once we find patient is not improving you can either do a ward that is surgical necrosectomy what we do in many of our patients is percutaneous endoscopic necrosectomy as i have shown you in one of the videos right <clears throat> so just to move away from drainage i think there are some collection interesting questions about the role of anticoagulants in uh, spleno portal thrombosis associated with acute pancreatitis so i think another important question so most patients uh, we don't give any any anticoagulants so the risk of developing portal vein venous thrombosis is about 10% majority of these patients have no problem they may develop for splenic vein thrombosis fundal varices but uh, multiple studies have shown that in the long term they have no problem if they have varicel bleeding you can manage endoscopically Mm -hmm. so there is no recommendation as of today to treat them Quite during the acute episode with anticoagulants right okay uh, well i think uh, the other questions relate to the timing of surgical intervention what surgery and when does the endoscopist <clears throat> feel that he has to refer to the surgeon and he gives up on endoscopic management so the timing of surgery is best after 4 weeks or even better after 6 weeks that is it but if you are if you are in a center where you don't have you know expert endoscopists to do these procedures my advice is to get the surgeon in very early, early. that four weeks onwards is the time when you have patient with infected necrosis you have placed a percutaneous catheter not improving this is time to go in otherwise they will develop low albumin malnutrition resistant infections and then there will be problems you're right so i think we still have a couple of minutes so what yeah, i'll sure. just roll back on the previous questions and i think uh, uh, one of these was uh, management of compartment syndrome secondary to increased abdomen abdo intra abdominal pressure in the first week diagnosing and what do you do about it okay so uh, this is an important problem for which we really don't have uh, much answer so in the beginning if you find the patient has intra abdominal hypertension the the pressure is above 14 or 16 or 18 or developing compartment syndrome see whether you can you do you have ascites if there is ascites drain the ascites put the patient nil by mouth put the patient on a nasogastric aspiration these patients may require tpn and if on your imaging you find there is a collection then you can do percutaneous drainage of the collection even the first or second week of illness because here the problem is of the pressure and compartment syndrome uh, some of the patient do not improve they may may require surgery laparostomy but it is extremely difficult and challenging procedure so most patients i would say will require conservative therapy wait for some time again the pressure gradually comes down once the inflammation subsides pressure comes down so nil by mouth nasogastric aspiration drainage of ascites and drainage of any collection which is there uh finally i think we'll just take one of the last question uh with you have talked about fulminant acute pa pancreatitis in your earlier presentations at sgpg at uh, aims and once there is rapid worsening of a patient the question is is there a role for ecmo extra corporeal membrane so, oxygenation in so, acute so, worsening patients so ecmo is something that we have not tried and it is something like any other critical illness if patient has respiratory failure to the extent that with with full support there is no improvement and you can you can try it we haven't done that but you can try it like any other patient critically ill patient with any other organs. critically ill patient they need it all right i think we last 2 uh, minutes of the live session according to my uh, time keeping so i think pramod i must really thank you it's been a very educative experience for me in person as well as i'm very sure 
for all the numerous uh, people who have logged in uh, for this webinar. Uh, the I think the question count is touching 400. So you'll have a full week ahead of you trying to answer, although there are some of them are repetitive questions. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, before we sign off, I think I'd just like to talk to you about uh, the next session. Sunday afternoon, uh, Dr. Ajay Dusheja, Professor of Hepatology, PGI Chandigarh, will be talking about the current and emerging management of non-alcoholic tier 2 hepatitis from 12 to 1. So all of you and your friends and family and anybody else who has your touch are all welcome to come and attend because uh, NASH is such a common problem that all of us uh, would like to learn to manage it uh, better. With this, I must thank Pramod, Govind and the entire team that has been supporting this uh, webinar from the ISU Secretariat at the All India Institute. Thank you very much. And all the participants and the delegates, thank you so much for joining in such large numbers. I believe we crossed 1,500 uh, delegates at some point during this uh, presentation, which I am very happy and is an impressive number. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'd like to thank all the participants and, and ISG also, and I'll be happy to answer the questions. Thank you. Great. Great. Okay. Sure. Bye.